What is going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode here of the Psy Guys Football Forum. I'm one of your co-hosts, Norman Desai, joined as always by my good friend, my good buddy. The other half of the Psy Guys is Tad Desai. And Tad, we continue our new head coaching deep dive mini series here with the fantasy spin on it. We've got another two coaches to there talk about. There are so many. <laughs> How are there this many head coaching jobs? It was crazy, it, actually. It doesn't to see make the sense. 10. It was surprising. It was oh definitely my surprising. god! Thank God it was eleven. Like, which one of us would have taken on the extra team? It's <laughs> I don't you. Know, maybe we would have. No, it's handled you. it together. I think we might have handled it together. Yeah, but I mean, you know, some of them were like slight adjustments. Obviously, you know, we haven't gotten to them yet. But you know, the Buccaneers with their change from oh Mc god, yeah, that was that was just another one from Bruce on there. Arians, and obviously we're going to cover the Saints a little bit later with the switch from. Um, Sean Payton stepping down to now being Dennis Allen, so within the same organization. So it may not see that much of a difference, but there's still new head coaching changes, so we had to count them. So that's why we're at 10 this year in this offseason. But yeah, you know what? It's been good to sort of give it the fantasy spin this year. Like I said, fantasy football season is going to be here sooner than people expect it to be, so it's always good to be ready, to be prepared with all of your notes and strategies and rankings and how you're going to attack your draft based on how things are playing out so you know what it's always good to have a leg up on your competition that's what me and tad are providing for you guys so Amir, real quick what is the team that you are covering today so yeah today's team that i am covering will be the las vegas raiders and tad you are covering if i remember correctly the new york giants today you correct? are correct so i'm glad right. you brought up the raiders because real quick question over under let's go Nine touchdowns for Devontae Adams with his new team. I think it's going to be over, actually. Oh, over. okay. All right. I'm feeling we're, very we're promising with that. Trade. Obviously, okay. we'll get into that a little bit later, obviously, with our breakdown there. But we obviously want to bring up one of our great partners here for the last, you know, handful of months, and that's Bet Online. So our partners at Bet Online continue to be the number one source for all of your betting needs and sports info. Find all the latest odds, news, and sports developments, including this year's NBA Finals. Uh, you got the NHL Stanley Cup Finals. You got some Major League Baseball games going on, obviously. We're coming at the June, almost at the All-Star break month, so we're getting a good idea as for where all those teams stack up, and it's actually now more important to watch the games <laughs> as opposed to maybe the first couple of months. It's like, eh, if I miss a handful, it's all good, but now it's starting to get Ooh, a little yeah. bit like nope, who time. are the real contenders, who are the pretenders, who's going to be active at the trade deadline, so that's going to be fun. Obviously, they got their UFC and MMA fighting news, and of course, with this being an NFL podcast, you got the NFL futures with, you know, the with teams with win loss. Obviously, Tad put it out there, but, you know, there's probably some over unders with uh, players and their receiving touchdowns, receiving Get those yards. Player props. player props is where I live, baby. Like, that is exactly. just, ah, love it. You obviously got the awards that happen at the end of the season MVP, Defensive Rookie of the Year, Comeback Player of the Year, Coach of the Year, all of that. So you can bet on all of that stuff. So Bet Online has you covered. So, hey, why don't you head to the website or your mobile device to sign up today? And if you use our promo code BELIEVE, that's capital B L E A V, you will receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Thanks to our friends at Bet Online. So make sure you use that promo code once again, capital B L E A V. The promo code is BELIEVE. Get the bonus and get into the action. Bet Online where the game starts. So, Ted, I'm going to pass the baton to you to get into the New York Giants and their new head coach, former Buffalo Bills offensive coordinator, Brian Dable. So, I mean, first things first, this was maybe my favorite hire of the offseason. I am such a Brian Dable fan uh, for reasons I'm going to get into, but it just excellent, excellent hire by them. Even if Danny Dimes doesn't work out, which I don't believe he will. Sorry, Giants fans, this is not going to be a kind segment to Danny, Daniel Jones, but the, the good news is I think this is going to be a kind segment to just about everybody else on that roster, so... Just quick intro on Brian Dable. Uh, fun fact, by the way, um, or this surprised me. He's born in Ontario. He's a Canadian. Oh, so Canada. Canada. Yeah. All right. How about that? And actually, and, and this makes a lot of sense. Is he? Uh, so he was born in Canada, but he actually grew up in Buffalo. Mm, so okay. it makes sense Got why it. he wants to stay in the, the New York region. So that was good. Uh, not much of a you know football playing career. He played college football, William and Mary, if my memory is correct, which is very iffy usually. But <laughs> he played small time college football. Got it. Um, he worked as a graduate assistant at Michigan State under Nick Saban. This guy keeps popping up. How about that? 
I mean, it's just, man, this, the, the amount of, like, influence is just absolutely insane. I mean, he's had a long coaching career, so, I mean, he's been around the block. Obviously, he's coached with Michigan State, formerly coached at LSU. Obviously, he's been at Alabama. He's at the NFL ranks with, you know, obviously, unless we speak about Miami, maybe that, but he had a sort of successful time at Cleveland with uh, Bill Belichick and all that time at that during that whole uh, the early 90s there. So, I mean, yeah, when you've been around as long as he has, it's sort of, you know, you look back at every coaching staff he's had. It's like you sort of notice these small names that were small at the time, but now it's like, that, oh, hey, he was there. And again, yeah, because it's not even like that's not even part of his coaching tree. He was only a yeah. GA under Saban. Uh, and this is actually a fact that blew my mind. Might be a little bit dramatic, but uh, that surprised <laughs> me. Um, he was Alabama's offensive coordinator that year. They beat Georgia in overtime. For the national championship that year, oh, where they had they brought in Tua, and the yeah, long yeah, where Jalen Hurts and Tua, think, that's right, yep, okay. mm-hmm. yeah. Got so it. he was wow. the offensive coordinator of Alabama that year. Wow, I know, I had the same reaction. I was like, he might have had a say with you know, let's switch back to Tua. Possibly. That's what, no that's idea. exactly why I was wondering. I'm like, wow, and plus it also made me wonder. What factor do you think that played with the Bills playing the Dolphins this past year? Of like, I know how to beat this guy. I can, I can get him. Like, just like you know, for once, let's bring Dable into the defensive room. Very, very possible. But then, of course, you know, Dable was hired in at, directly after that season, actually, as the Bills' offensive coordinator, where he made a name for himself, deservedly so, turning Josh Allen not only into the best quarterback from that draft class, but the best quarterback, arguably, in the NFL. I think, you know, that, 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 that might, that's a bit of a hot take, but he is in the upper echelon. For sure. It'll take, it'll take a little bit of a debate, but you probably could easily win that debate with some strong supporting arguments. So, yeah. yeah, so, and, yeah. and you got to remember, people were talking about, like, how the hell is this guy even being talked as a first rounder, yeah, let alone the right best, there. you know, QB out of that draft class. So he deservedly got this great job in New York City. So going into philosophy, uh, here's what I like so much about Dable is I would love to be like, you know, I'm sure fans are going to love hearing me say, hey, look, no wide zone blocking scheme today all right for for the first time this series there's no wide zone blocking scheme but it's because he doesn't have a set philosophy he he builds to what he has and that's what makes him such a good coach so it's really hard to really kind of pinpoint of like oh this is what he's gonna bring but there are three things that no matter what system he has he absolutely loves that is pre-snap motion so quarterback extends receiver tight end into motion play action and then mesh and crossing routes. And Murr, I'm going to dumb this down for our you know lesser knowledge viewers. I think that's a nice way of saying that. Nice, nice yeah, way, yeah. at least. Um, mesh and crossing routes are literally when the receivers on opposite ends of the field go like this. Like when I ran that in high school, we literally were like required to high five the guy we were passing. Like that's how close we had to get to each other. So there are a couple of reasons for this. The first two, the pre stop motion play act. Action. This is why Dable got the job is because he understands that for your quarterback to succeed, you've got to simplify the offense. So pre-snap motion right off the bat lets the quarterback know that, okay, we're, we're in man coverage or we're in zone coverage. So no matter how uh, inexperienced, I think that's a nice way of saying it, how inexperienced your quarterback is, they at least you get that out of their back right away. And then play action, okay, you, you know, spend some time fake handing off the ball, you turn around, play's developed a little bit. You, they, they don't have to make the read right away, okay? Then the, the mesh and crossing routes, that's where he can, kind of combines these two things where it's just those confuse the hell out of the defense. Unless you have a guy like Darius Leonard or um, I'm, I'm, I'm going back in my, you know, in the timeline, but Patrick Willis or like a true field general, it's like, okay, you got that guy. You got that guy. If you don't have that and they run a mesh route, it's very easy for a linebacker to be like, no, no, no I thought you – no, no, did I have it? And it just causes confusion. So the, those are the three things you will always see in a Brian Dable offense. So uh, the other thing you'll see is a power zone run scheme, which basically means the offensive lineman, you're not going after a particular guy. You just have your gap, and you just block whoever the hell is coming into that gap. What that means for the running back is it's usually off the tackle runs, so power runs, or counter inside zone runs. So that's why I think Saquon Barkley actually is a you know pretty good, if he can stay healthy, a pretty good fantasy candidate when I know that's a real hot take there. But <laughs> Barkley has that that you know combination of 
you know, elusiveness, but can still put up with contact to really succeed in the system. So I, I, I know that wasn't a real, like in the weeds breakdown. Um, but it, again, it's just hard because Dable is just so that that's where he thrives. This is his ability to adapt. So that's why I predict we'll see a lot of the Giants offense, but I'm honestly really not sure what we're going to see. No, that's fair. Also, you know, he's mainly been an offense coordinator in the NFL, so he's probably still developing a lot oh, of what he he's wants. He's been OC for stuff. like five different teams as well. So it's like, whoa, what system does he love? It's like, well, he's worked under like six different systems. So it's And like, that could be a good thing or it could be a bad I, yeah, thing where exactly. it's like, you know, you pick up a little bit from every spot that you've been at or it's more of like, well, I like this here. So it's like, is it going to work here? It's like, do I like, I like this when I was here. It's like, will that work here? So I think it's like sometimes, you know, sort of like, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen can sometimes obviously spoil the soup so this could be a very similar situation where it's like if he's taking too much from other teams that can obviously go away from what made him successful in buffalo more recently right so we'll see what what plays out obviously yeah so i I, i'm personally the belief that that's actually where he draws his strength from is seeing all these different systems what works what doesn't and just kind of Mm -hmm. creating this weird frankenstein monster of an offense and you know and like you said the success in buffalo i think a big part of that was stefan Diggs. so you know moving on to players that could benefit it's an easy pick but it's not saquon barkley don't worry people um (laughs) it's an easy pick but i I gotta do it it's kenny galladay I mean, you just see what this, what Dable has been able to turn Stephon Diggs, Gabriel Davis, Cole Beasley. Like he just knows how to work a receiver in his best skill set. So I'm not going to say like, oh, he's going to use Kenny Galladay this particular way because I'm not sure how he's going to use Kenny Galladay, but I'm confident he knows the the right way to do so. So I think that Kenny Galladay, despite being, and, and Mer, I actually have this question for you: Is Kenny Galladay the most disappointing fantasy player from last season? Because I was trying to think of a more disappointing one, but he's high on that list. He's definitely high on that list. You could definitely barring throw Calvin injury, Ridley on that injury. list. I mean, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, but, but yeah, but well, injury. That, that sort of plays into that reasons. barring injury. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That you know, his mental status that ended well, up not I, being yeah, mental the, status. The, right? I was say, the quotes was not for mental health. The quotes was because that was definitely the gambling thing. Yeah, exactly. So, but yeah, he's definitely one of them, especially with the contract they signed. You just expect yeah. him to be that premier yeah. receiver in New York, give Daniel Jones a legitimate weapon, but it just didn't end up being the case. So, so um, if Brian Dable can turn around Kenny Galladay's career, that's definitely a win for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, like I say, it's the number one receiver uh, with him and, uh, I really think that, you know, just starting off right off the draft, you're talking about Galladay as a bottom tier wide receiver two, which is I'm sure higher than some people have him, but that's where I have him. But with the potential to get into just solidified wide receiver one status. So that is something I, I think has a lot of mid round promise right there. Uh, this next player. I have no stats to back this up. This is pure gut feeling. I don't even know if he's going to be on the team, to be honest. We're, we're going to see. Kadarius Tony. Mm, okay. I, I, I got to go for it. He's just so talented that I just, I think Dable has got to figure out some way to make him work. Like, an offensive-minded genius. I know there are all the trade rumors, but notice how those have died down. Substan- I think that was just draft hype, to be totally honest. I think that was just – I'm, I'm not saying that never would have happened, but I think the Giants were like, see if we can make something happen. Think of the interest they wanted. They're like, okay, we'll keep him. So I, I, I do think that Tony, would I draft him? Probably not, but I, he is again at the top of my watch list on the waiver wire. Um, so yeah, it's just got to keep an eye out for it. Cause he's just too talented for, for a smart guy like Dable not to take advantage of the final guy. Now this is one of my hotter takes probably will be one of my hottest takes come from the series. I really do believe this is one of the best sleepers in fantasy football this year. And again, if you're one of my friends listening to this, uh, I'm kidding. Stay far, far away from this man. Ricky seals. Jones is now pick. slated to be the giants uh, starting tight end. I got to readjust my mic just to, you know, handle this hot take. So look, Ricky seals. Jones. I know it's, it's, it's not an unrecognizable name at this point, but is, that is a journeyman. If I've ever seen one, like he bounced from Arizona to Washington. I think there was a team in between there. But here's the deal. Brian Dable loves him some tight ends. Look at what, if I told you Dawson Knox was going to finish as a top five tight end last year, you would have said I was insane. Lo and behold, Dawson Knox had a great season last year. Dable loves utilizing. He probably would have finished as a top five tight end. Exactly. Biggest thing. 
in it. Well, I was kind of leaving that part out, but yeah. So <laughs> Dable loves utilizing not just tight ends, but big athletic tight ends. And Ricky Steele's Jones was a receiver in college at A&M. So he is an athletic tight end. I, I, I'm not saying he's going to finish this top five tight end, but I am saying that this guy is going to, in my opinion, end up as a borderline top 10. Like he's going to finish in the eight to 12 to eight to 15 range. Wow. I really do believe that. I think the system's wow. going to fit him if he sell, stays healthy. I need to throw that, you know, qualifier in there, but I, I, I am a big believer. Ricky seals Jones. Should you draft him? Maybe that's my hot take. Maybe if someone drafted Whoa. seals Jones in the last two rounds, don't do it before that. That that's stupid. But last two rounds, if someone wants to take a flyer in seals Jones, I don't hate it. To be totally honest, I, I really love just with his athleticism, with how much we know Dable loves utilizing athletic tight ends. Like I said, that pre-snap motion, that's a lot of tight end work, too. That's not so much as receivers are part of it, but most of it's tight end work. Like he loves utilizing a good athletic tight end. It's not like the Rams where they love utilizing them as a blocker. He loves utilizing them not just as a target, but especially as a red zone target. So I and again, here honestly, I'd be way more on this boat. It's not my concerns about Ricky Seals Jones. It's my concerns about Daniel Jones. Because notice that Daniel Jones is not on my list. Yeah. I'm sure. not a believer on, in this guy whatsoever. So if, if Seals Jones sucks, I'm putting it on Danny Dimes, not Seals Jones. <laughs> Fair enough. It definitely, you know, any sort of receiver running back, you know, the system sort of plays a part of it. But the quarterback also plays a huge part of their success as well. So, yeah, if Daniel Jones is just not the answer anymore. Then that's really going to hurt production <sighs> for Kenny hey, Galladay. Hey, don't hey, don't forget, by the Jones, way, Sterling they're... Shepard, Darius Slayton, all these guys that they have on their roster, they will all be affected fantasy wise because of the, you know, we'll see, obviously. But well, just, and... if the poor play of Daniel Jones continues on, that will obviously restrict their fantasy projections heading into 2022. And do you know who Daniel Jones' backup is? I think it's Tarod Taylor, if I remember correctly. Exactly right. So it's it's not like he's on a you know unlimited leash here. Like if he sucks the first four or five weeks, it wouldn't honestly shock me that much to see him benched. It's very possible because you gotta remember he's not Dable's guy. Dable has this. It's true. It's very true. We will see what happens with the New York Giants, Daniel Jones, and of course new head coach Brian Dable. So let's switch things to the AFC side of the coin here and. I'm going to bring up a name, Tad, that you are not too fond of, and that is Josh McDaniels, new head oh, coach for the now, Las now, Vegas Now he decides to take a head coaching job. Okay. All right. I see how it is. Uh, so a little bit of Josh McDaniels before we get into his philosophy. It's a Number one, he's a backstabber. Coaches. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. I got some interesting notes there. Um, Number so two, he's played, a weasel. <laughs> he played quarterback in high school, but then when he went to college, he had to change positions to wide receiver because – in college, he was beaten out by none other than Nick Casario, current GM for the Houston Texans, and that. obviously formerly with the New England Patriots. What college was that? I was going to ask you. Can you guess which college they played at? Nick Casario, Josh McDaniels. Can Nick I get Cazario, like a tier? Is it, D, is it D1 at least? I don't think this is a D1 school. Oh, shit. I, I think I, it's D2 I, I, or I am, I am possibly SOL. FCS. I, am, I really have oh, no idea, man. but it so, is a small school. I am SOL there. Um, I'm in Houston. Or, uh, Houston. Uh, I'm in Texas, so I, I don't know. Sam Houston State? It is not Sam Houston State. But here are some other notable alumni that played with both Casario and Josh McDaniels. London Fletcher played there during the same time. Former Chargers GM Tom Telesco played there. And the now Las Vegas Raiders GM and formerly with the New England Patriots as well, David Ziegler, played there as well. So I don't know if that helps you at all. I don't think it did. <laughs> oh, man, this here I'm so max like 13 year old tag could have answered this because when London Fletcher was still on Madden and you yep. see what their colleges are. Yep. Um, where's the De, uh, Deion Sanders coaching? Is it there? It's not Jackson, Jackson State. State. Yeah. <laughs> the correct answer is John Carroll University. Oh, God, no. I never would have gotten that. Jesus. Um, but, that yeah, really he obviously did not have a successful playing career. He played in college but never played in the NFLs. What he was able to do was partly yeah, a friendship. Yeah, NFLs. There are multiple NFLs. <laughs> What he did was it what he was able to do was partly a friendship that his father had with a name we already brought up already, Nick Saban. And he was able to become a graduate I, assistant. How many coaches in this guy said Jesus? With Nick Saban at Michigan State. <laughs> My God. 
<laughs> yeah, and then obviously a little bit later, he was able to join the New England Patriots as a personnel assistant, was able to work himself up to the offensive coordinator within five seasons. He was then named the Denver Broncos head coach in 2009. It was not a very successful tenure for him in Denver. He was fired in less than two seasons. He returned to the Patriots in the 2012 season after having a cup of coffee with the Rams during the 2011 season. Oh, my God, I forgot about that Rams season. Oh, my God, I forgot about that. I was so excited when that happened. That was when they were still in St. Louis, right? That's correct. Yeah, I was so excited when that happened because I think that was when we got Case Keenum as well, if I have my ears right. I was like, let's go, baby. Oh, poor oblivious past tad. Yeah, and you so poor he's little been with the Patriots. So Josh McDaniels has been with the Patriots since that 2012 season. So now let's bring up the reason why Tad hates Josh McDaniels. So during the yeah, 2018 man, off season, right. yeah. he oh, was yeah, named no, no. the let's, new let's head coach of the mm-hmm. Indianapolis Colts. Yep, but he declined the position the very same day to stay with the Patriots. No, and no, 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 no. You have the no, no. He accepted the position. He accepted the position, yeah, but then he declined the position the very same day. That's what I wanted to emphasize there. Are you sure it was the same day? I'm pretty sure mm-hmm. there was like a couple. Are you sure? Mm-hmm. Wow, my hatred, my my hatred has warped hatred my has sense grown of reality. now. <laughs> my my hatred has warped my sense of reality of like, okay, cool, we got McDaniel's. And I legitimately thought it was like a two week period. Where nope. are you positive? Because he had his whole staff set up and everything. Nope. They set up the staff, obviously, beforehand. These are the people they wanted to hire on, but it was literally the day that they were going to announce him. Oh, they... the day they were going to introduce him. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I misunder- I thought you... Okay. Sorry. I misunderstood. Yes. The day they were going to introduce him, because that's my favorite part. They turned the press conference from introducing Josh McDaniels to fuck Josh McDaniels. Exactly. So... There's obviously a lot of rumors as to why he decided to decline that position. A lot of people said that maybe he was going to the heir apparent for Bill Belichick in New England. Maybe he just thought he wasn't ready for the position, whatever it was. But it seems like maybe what because he doesn't have a spine. A little bit later is that because of the football operations aspect that Indianapolis was not clear of. So things that are football operations related, like who does the strength and conditioning coach uh, report to? How does the medical staff sort of figure out things? How does the video stuff work? It's like all these small things that's like you wouldn't think would be that important. He is such Chris- a Belichick wannabe. God damn it. But that's that's sort of the disagreement. So Chris Ballard sort of had it under the understanding that the GM would handle lots of these things. Josh McDaniels coming from New England. This is where things Bill Belichick handled. So that was some of the disagreement. He wanted it a little bit more ironed out. So that's why he ultimately declined the position because of all of this and how the scenario played out. His longtime agent at the time, Bob Lamonte, terminated his representation good, of good. McDaniels. Good for you, Lamonte. Good for you, baby. I say with Lamonte, baby. Okay, let's move on because obviously there's a lot more. I will never move on. Don't you (gasps) dare ask me to do that. So he has won six Super Bowls during his time in New England as offense coordinator and hopefully will bring one to the Raiders, hopefully in the near future here. So Uh let's get into the philosophy here. So with McDaniels, I think the biggest thing is balance. You want the balance of the run game. You want the balance of the pass game as well. So he sort of had to skew from that a little bit. Coaching rookie Mac Jones last year, they sort of leaned a little bit more on the run to take the pressure off Mac Jones. But the nice thing is that now coming to Las Vegas, you have a veteran quarterback in Derek Carr. You could probably experiment a little bit more with him. You could take a little bit more chances. You can experiment with the playbook, have a mix of the run as well as a good mixture of the pass. So they'd be a little bit more of a balanced offense, keep the defense on their toes as far as what's coming. So here's one thing McDaniels is surprisingly really good at. He can take a very complex play or formation and simplify it to take advantage of a potentially weaker offensive line. So you look at the Las Vegas Raiders. They don't have the strongest offensive line. And the biggest thing that Josh McDaniels can do then is he can set up these formations. So then he uses the tight ends to chip in and block some people on the offensive line as far as the line of scrimmage is concerned to get his offensive line to get to the next level, which can block a lot easier of these defenders like linebackers, potential safeties coming in on blocks, defensive backs, slot corners, those sorts of things. It's a lot easier an assignment compared to taking on a big old defensive tackle or defensive end coming at you sort of thing. So you add those sorts of um, uh, adjustments to this line of scrimmage as far as the blocking is concerned um you focus more on gap heavy scheme as opposed to zone blocking zone blocking is you're more responsible for relying on the people next to you and you know the offensive line sort of has to work as a unit whereas gap heavy scheme is more of just like you find your guy you block him once he's done you go to your next guy sort of thing so this is more of what can be sort of taken advantage of if you have a weaker offensive line because now they're just focused on taking on the one guy as opposed to like working with the unit to make sure you're communicating well understanding things a little bit a lot 
you have to understand a lot in a zone scheme as opposed to a gap heavy scheme. So that's going to alleviate a lot of the issues that the Las Vegas Raiders may have had possibly with their sort of eh, mediocre offensive line. I wouldn't say it's the worst. I wouldn't say it's the no, best, but I mean, it's definitely somewhere in the middle. Yeah. After nuking that offensive line last off season, they, they did a fair job rebuilding it. Uh, it's yeah. I, I think you put it perfectly. It's it's middle tier, like bottom, bottom middle tier. Exactly, exactly. So switching it over to the passing game, I mean, we saw this consistently in New England. It's taking advantage of that West Coast offense. I know we sort of brought this up the last episode. Almost every team features a West Coast offense, but definitely New England leverages it a lot. This is how, you know, guys like Wes Welker, Julian Edelman, Danny Amendola, these guys made a name for themselves in this system because they were able to take advantage of being these slot receivers that are quick, taking advantage of the quick intermediate passes and doing a lot with it yards after the catch the yak guy so this is something that can be really leveraged here in las vegas as well you got some guys that can play the slot they just acquired Devontae adams an excellent route runner he could sort of move with the ball runner hunter renfro was amazing in the slot he had a really great season last year he'll be able to take advantage and a guy like Jared waller who's a really good speed he's a mismatch for a defense he could really benefit in the system as well so it's also a lot of option routes for the receivers so they need to really understand what the defense is doing what the defenders are doing they could sort of base their route based off how the defense is sort of set up that will get them into more open situations for Derek Carr to hit them more consistently so it's a lot for the receivers to understand but I think they have very capable smart receivers that they'll be able to understand this offense very quickly and take advantage of what the defense is giving them so we should see a little bit of a new look offense with the Raiders here and I think it'll benefit the skill players that they have there will really fit in well so let's transition to that who stands to benefit the most here so a lot of people were taking issue with this one. They were surprised that Josh Jacobs had his fifth year mm. rookie option decline. Honestly, to but be fair, I was I was one of those surprised. I I look as he had the career they hoped. No, but I, for a fifth year option is not that expensive. Um, it's, it's not, but you know what? It's not the end of the world that his no, fifth year option was declined. Right. They probably no. want to work on an extension a lot sooner. And Josh McDaniels has and, gone on well, record saying that he quick. wants to use him a lot. And let's not forget that also light the fire on his ass of that, like, all right, man, you, you want, you want your big contract, earn it. Otherwise we're done. Like uh, we're not wasting another year here. So I, I could see that aspect as well. Yeah. But you also have to understand that the shelf life for a running back is like, you know, not that long. They also drafted Zamir white out of Georgia in this year's mm -hmm. draft. They have Kenyon Drake on the roster. They have, Brandon Bolden, who came from the New England Patriots, he's on the roster this year. They have Amir Abdullah. So definitely they're taking Amir Abdullah is a Raider? He is a Raider. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so they're definitely taking precaution in case, you know, Josh Jacobs just, you know, like that that fire lit under his ass just doesn't work out. They can let him go, and they have these other options as well because they also want to make sure they maintain the tread on that tire as well. But just – Josh Jacobs could really benefit in this style of offense because as opposed to a zone blocking scheme where you sort of have to adjust and find where the hole is in a gap heavy scheme, they create the hole for you. So you literally just have to find it go. And I think that's something that Josh Jacobs can sort of benefit from as opposed to creating his own offense. He just needs to find the hole, hit it and go. And I think that will really benefit him. Plus he's a dual threat running back and Josh McDaniels, obviously coming from new England likes to use running backs out of the backfield as a pass catcher. So he could definitely benefit as well. So Josh Jacobs, I think could stand to really get a lot of promise in this offense as far as fantasy purposes for sure. Um, I already brought this name up before, but Hunter Renfro, wide receiver. Yeah. I mean, this is just this all into the wild. same line as the, all the guys that Man. I just mentioned already. Edelman, Welker, Amendola, so many guys have already been such successful names um, under this system, and I think Renfro is going to be the He's next gonna, name. It's going to be ridiculous. Like, it, it, it honestly wouldn't shock me if he got like close to 15 touchdowns this season. But I think the crazy thing is that Renfro finished as the number 10 fantasy receiver based on ESPN standard scoring bottle, which is a PPR scory bottle. Just imagine what he could do now with Josh McDaniels as his head coach and he, offensive coordinator, right? Like, he I mean, honestly could be the third receiver off the board and I would totally understand. Yeah. I mean, I think he could have at least repeat performance of that season. Like, I mean, this guy could borderline be in the same conversation with Devonte Adams as being like the best yeah. receivers on yeah. this team. And I think they're both going to benefit whatever fantasy roster they get drafted to. So, I mean, he had a great last season. I know the addition of Devonte Adams is going to scare some people off. I think he'll be the person that's scared off. I think it helps. He's going more. to bet. Exactly. I think he may benefit more. He's already familiar with Derek Carr. He's already built up that relationship. This system is sort of built around around his skill set not saying that Devontae Adams is not going to be good but just I think Hunter Renfro is a guy people may be sleeping on a little bit because of that Devontae Adams mm -hmm. acquisition 
but take advantage of those cautious cats because you could be the beneficiary then. Um, last name that I want to bring up is Kenyon Drake, the running back. So wow. I already brought up the fact that Josh Jacobs is going to benefit, on, but I think on. Kenyon quick, Drake. I can, I can do that better. Hold on. <clears throat> wow. How was that? That was closer. It didn't help because your video stopped out. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. I hate my internet. <laughs> so Kenyon Drake, you know, I think he's going to fill the James White role in this mm, office that Josh okay. McDaniels had in the previous role. So while Jacobs is a great dual threat running back, I think, like I mentioned, they have a lot of running backs in this backfield. They want to limit the usage because obviously, you know, they want to get the most out of him, especially when they get deeper in the season. If they make the playoffs, they definitely want to use their best players more often. So it's like long, like extend the shelf life for Josh Jacobs as much as they can. And so Kenyon Drake, I think, could fill that role very nicely, complement Josh Jacobs really well. You look at last season with the Raiders, Drake finished with more receiving yards then rushing yards. He had 253 rushing yards, 291 receiving yards. So, I mean, okay. they clearly have a plan for him to be more of that pass-catching running back as opposed to being more of a rusher. But, hey, if Josh Jacobs, unfortunately, he has dealt with injuries every so often, and he, there's a couple of games that he misses, can you drink the step in as a I had him as well? on my fantasy team last year. You don't need to tell me. My God, that was annoying. Exactly. I but feel like the, the episode of the league of, like, what does questionable even mean? <laughs> exactly. So, I mean – he definitely is a good handcuff handcuff option, excuse me. But even if both running backs are healthy, Jacobs and Kenyon Drake, I think they both can be really beneficial in this offense. Kenyon Drake, especially PPR leagues, being that pass catching running yeah, back. Josh Jacobs yeah. being the runner, but also used as a pass catcher. Like both these running backs are going to get usage in the system based on what we've seen in New England and McDaniel's system. So honestly, even though it's Josh Jacobs being the lead back there, he's definitely going to circum sub carries to Kenyon Drake. Some of the other guys too, maybe to an extent, but I think these are two names to keep in mind. But honestly, Honestly, this Raiders offense sort of is a, lot of a good option for some fantasy players. Like, yep. I mean, I know a lot of people like to downgrade Derek Carr, but I think getting a better in offensive coordinator, offensive guru in the NFL for a long time, Josh McDaniels, I think that's going to benefit him a lot <laughs> too. So, guru, okay. <laughs> he's found success in the NFL. He had to cause somewhat mm -hmm. called, maybe not a guru, mm -hmm. but it's like he's, he's one of the, you know, good minds in the NFL as far as being an offensive, you know, creator i guess good Schemer. good Schemer. good mind bad decision maker but anyway <laughs> no I, I i really like your picks i i love that comparison kenny and drake to james white uh i could definitely see that happening and don't forget james white james white it was frustrating fancy wise because he always did okay it was just yeah. like what was the one week he was going to do well um exactly. because yeah it exactly. just raked in like you know five catches a game so you you always knew like if you're really really hurting for a flex spot just plug james white in there at least he's not going to lay an egg for you so i could see kenny drake filling that uh i'm sure you didn't pick this guy because he's already a fancy star but i'm expecting huge things out darren waller this year don't forget, yeah. this is the this is the man that turned Gronk into what Gronk is. Like this True. is, and you 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 have a tight end who is arguably more athletic than Gronk. I know I, that that's a little controversial. Let's be real; they're both athletic freaks. He has a big athletic freak there at tight end. So Darren Waller, I also expect to have that just a massive year this year. Honestly, this might be a hot take. It wouldn't shock me if Darren Waller finishes tight end one this year. He has the potential and he's in the right system. So it could very well happen. So it's not that much of a hot take, but yeah, I expect him to flourish a lot in this system as well. So those are the two next coaches that we want to discuss. Obviously we got into Brian Dable early earlier with the New York giants and we just finished up here with La Las Vegas Raiders and Josh McDaniels. Uh, like we sort of teased earlier, we still got a couple more coaches to go, a couple more episodes to go, but it's a lot of fun. Like I said, there's a lot of fantasy prep for you guys. So give you much guys research. A leg up on the competition. That's the biggest thing that we're trying to give for you guys. Make sure you ahead and you could just dominate your leagues with all the prep that we're giving to you guys. So yeah, make sure you're following us at all the Twitter handles that we have down below. You got my personal handle under the side 23. You got Tad's at Tad the side 94. You got the show handle at uh, the decide guys and more on Instagram. Follow us at the decide guys as well. Uh, we got more of these videos coming up in the next couple of weeks. So make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel, LAFB networks, uh, YouTube channel where we have our own individual playlist and so make sure you subscribe there. And of course we are making these YouTube episodes, our podcast episodes, Episodes, but regardless of that, once we start breaking out some new podcast episodes, make sure you're always aware about when all that's happening too. So subscribe where you listen to your podcast, whether it's on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, 
LAFB Network website. I mean, there's a ton of platforms out there. Just hit that subscribe button. Always be up to date with the latest and greatest that's happening with us. Um, but yeah, I mean, guys, we're really happy to give you some fantasy content. We're hitting the ground running this year. Last year, we were sort of like in the middle of the season. We made that switch. But this year, we're like gung-ho. As soon as the season's kicking off, you're going to be getting some great fantasy content from us. We're already getting it for you right now. Hopefully, you know, within the next couple of months, we're going to be giving you a lot more content with some rankings and some fantasy mock drafts and some sleepers and busts and just a lot of great things that we're planning. Hopefully, we can get to all of it. But just, yeah, we are your source for fantasy content. Me and Tad have you covered for sure. And to everybody that's following us on Twitter, who's listening to the podcast, who's watching our videos, who subscribes, who's gave us a good rating. I mean, just anything and everything, guys. Seriously, we just can't thank you enough. And as always, guys, please, like Amir said, check out the LAFB Network YouTube channel and their website, but the YouTube newly channel. Newly redesigned website. That's and the big thing, redesigned too. Website. It looks sweet. It looks yeah, sweet. it does. Oh, it's so much nicer. Uh, not <laughs> Sorry, if you're listening, Ryan, that was last, the last site was great, man. This is better. But... uh basically check us out on YouTube, but guys, if you're checking us out on YouTube or really any other LAFP video on YouTube and you are like, Hey, this is a good watch. Just do us a favor. Hit that like button. Cause that, that really helps drive our engagement. It really, really does us a huge favor because I, I noticed you guys are watching our stuff, which is great. I, I really appreciate it, but just scroll down just like half an inch. Click that like button. We'll do us a massive favor, but you know, even if you don't, thanks for watching. And Unlike one very rude YouTube commenter a couple months ago, thank you for not asking me to turn my mic off. So I, I, we always really do appreciate the support. <laughs> Didn't say anything about Mer, but me apparently. God, you know, God forbid I have opinions. Uh, please, God, let Kenny Pickett work out. Um, but as always, everyone, thank you so much for all the support. We definitely does not go unnoticed, and and thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, I mean, like Amir said, we got more ahead of your way, so be sure to just keep up to date with our Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and everything, because we 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 have a lot of content heading your way.